I made a set of axes. It's pretty cool. So you got your X, Y, and then right hand roll. This is Z. So I got my right handed coordinate system. And this, you know that that object I keep drawing? Just a box. There it is. Here's a box. So if we place the coordinate system rigidly attached to the box, then uh, we're good to go. This describes how this thing is moving in space. So maybe I'll, I'll use this for other things. Um, my hair's getting long. Take a haircut. So we've got this frame rigidly attached. And I wanted to show you something. Most of your phones have a built-in um, attitude sensor. So let me move my little camera down. So you can see I've now, this is attached. It's just kind of resting there. And then I'll take my giant iPhone, otherwise known as an iPad. And I think I've got a, yeah, there we go. Whoa, it's kind of freaking out. Let me share my screen here and you'll be able to see what's going on. It was kind of hard to find an app that actually worked, but there was a former um, professor, Virginia Tech, uh, Lee McHugh, and she made this app that was made for, you were supposed to like put the iPhone on your boat and it would tell you for your boats pitching and yawing and rolling, uh, but it has, it has um, I'll get this thing to turn. Whoa, what's happening? Whoa. It's got a different convention than the usual yaw pitch and roll. So if I go to here and then start labeling things as they would appear, this direction, um, so this Z direction, we got B3, let's call that B3. And then these other two, this is B2, um, and this is B1. And so this is the iPhone or the iPad. It uses a different Euler angle convention. I'm not sure why. So it uses a, I'm calling it non-standard, but given how many iPhones there are, maybe they've created a new standard uses a, let's call it a non-standard set of Euler angles. But it still calls them yaw, pitch, and roll. So you have to be careful. Three, this uses the three, one, two. But it calls rotation about the number three axis, yaw. Remember now here, B3 is pointing up. Usually with the uh, vehicle convention, B3 is pointing down. So this means a turn to the left, a clockwise, uh, counterclockwise turn will be positive. And then it calls rotation about the number one axis. It calls that pitch. So what would that be? Using the right hand rule, the uh, something like that, pitch. And then roll something, something like, so the number two axis. I think that's what it does. We could check that out. And so to do that, I'll put my little coordinate system in my little camera now, you can see, and go back to this app. It's called Scramp. But if, so if you can see, I'm showing the readout that the screen is showing. Right now it's saying all the angles are zero. And if I now rotate about the number three axis, the one pointing up, it's calling that yaw. You see that dark blue line going up. So positive yaw, go back to zero, negative yaw. Okay, now what about if I tilt, do a positive tilt about the number one axis? That's this one pointing this way. So right hand rule, say this would be positive. Uh, so it is, it is actually calling that pitch, so that's good. And then the rotation about this axis, it's gonna, it should call roll positive rotation. Whoa. Whoa. 
So I think I need to I'll update. That, that that's kind of cool, right? So you could, if you have an experiment with something, you could just put a uh, an iPhone or an iPad in it, and this actually records. You see that record option in the lower right, and I'm sure there's other apps that can do this, but this is one that that does it. So, so that's cool. So I think it uh, it actually did do this closer to correct. Um, it called this, it did call this uh, roll and this one pitch. So that's good. So that kind of, kind of fits what we want. And then this is roll. The yaw though is a separate because it's the B3 is pointing up and in the vehicle it's typically pointing down. So, okay, I might use this frame again. I like that. I've got other vectors I can use. Okay, let's put that arbitrary rigid body away. All right, today I wanted to talk about um, torque-free motion. Um, oh, I'm told MATLAB has a similar app. Okay, I'll check it out. That gives a yaw pitch and roll and records things. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that's good for experiments. And phones are readily available, right? They have accelerometers in them too. So it makes them good. Okay. So the uh, a free rigid body or torque free motion is what we started talking about last time it's it, because it's like the simplest it's the simplest um, analysis that we can do for 3d motion of a rigid body because when you start adding moments things get more complicated so we're going to consider the torque free motion case And we're not gonna worry about what the center of mass is doing. We're just looking at, um, and so this is, you know, mi equals zero, i equals one, two, and three. All three components of the moment are zero. And I'll be following the way they do things in example uh, 11, 10 of the book. So this is a body out in space. There's my rigid body. It's just out in space. There's no moments. It's also equivalent to free fall. If you can neglect uh, aerodynamics, then like when you toss up a book or toss anything, it's basically spinning and uh, with no moment. And what's it spinning about? Well, there's no, unless it's you know got some kind of obvious pivot, which if you're free, there isn't. So it's spinning about its center of mass. So that means we would calculate everything about the center of mass, rotation about the center of mass, moment of inertia about the center of mass. Okay, so we will use, use the center of mass as our reference point. And the, we wrote what the moments of inertia um, or the Euler e equations when we go into a principal axis frame. So we're using G as our re reference point. And like, if this is our object and we had some kind of weird initial set of uh, body fixed directions, we would change that and pick principal axes. So something that's three directions, the three directions that are the the triad of basis vectors, which form a right-handed coordinate system and are aligned with the principal axes of the body. So we could either get that by a calculation or if it's a body with some kind of symmetry like this, we could just sort of find it. So we've got our, our principal axes and we'll use the principal axis frame.
because then the moment of inertia matrix is just diagonal. And the Euler's second law, that's the rotational equations, are I1 omega 1 dot minus I2 minus I3 omega 2 omega 3 equals 0. That's the first one. And then we've got the other two, which are just cyclic permutations of the first equation. Okay, so we've got these three nonlinear ordinary differential equations for the omegas. And to initially analyze this, we will, because it's, it's a coupled set of ODEs, coupled nonlinear set of ODEs. We're going to make an assumption to simplify it, or to make the analysis simpler. We're going to make an assumption that this body is mostly rotating about one particular axis, and then maybe it's a little bit off. So it's mostly spinning about one particular axis, but maybe it has a slight um, uh, angular velocity component in the other two directions. So if I were to draw that schematically, let's, uh, let's draw the box, rigid body. And we've got our body fixed frame, which you could think of as based at the center of mass if you want. So got B1, B2, and then up here, B3. And we're gonna say that we've got, a, um, we've got an angular velocity of the, this is of the B frame with respect to the I frame. Of course, we're viewing this vector in body fixed coordinates and the projection onto one of the directions is very large compared to the projection on the other two. So in this case that I've drawn the projection uh, onto the B3 direction, so omega three is very large. So in this schematic, um, we have a large spin about the B3 axis. Okay, and we wanna know, we're gonna ask the question, how does the, how does the angular velocity vector evolve And we're thinking of it viewed in the body fixed frame. How does the angular velocity vector move? As seen in the body fixed frame. So let's say this was our initial angular velocity. Now what's going to happen? And everything's viewed in the body fixed frame, remember? Maybe you don't, but why do we do everything in terms of the body fixed frame? It's because the moment of inertia matrix is constant as viewed in the body fixed frame. So we do, which was, this was, I had a hard time with this uh, when I was first learning about rigid body dynamics. It seemed non-intuitive to me. Like, why are we doing all these calculations in the body fixed frame? We're trying to solve for what the body fixed frame is doing. But it turns out um, that, that a moment of inertia matrix that required taking those integrals. If you were to do the calculation purely in a, with respect to an inertial set of axes, then every, at each moment in time, that moment of inertia matrix is changing. So you wanna pick a frame where the moment of inertia is not changing, that three by three matrix, 
or principal axes, those three entries are not changing. So we try to do all calculations in the body fixed frame. So we're making, we're gonna make this assumption here that the angular velocity vector has a large component. So we'll call this zero, zero. We'll say it's got a large component in that number three direction. And I'll call that omega s. So over here, instead of calling this w3, this is ws or omega s. So we've got that, which is large, and then everything else, omega one, omega two, and I'll call, let's say there's some, possibly some other component, capital omega three, that's small. And all of these are in the body fixed frame. So we are going to assume that um, omega s, the magnitude of it, is much larger than the magnitude of omega one and omega two, and then possibly some small component. We're also just gonna, um, yeah, that's the main assumption, okay? So we've got omega three can be written as omega s plus omega, big omega three, where omega s is the really large component. And in fact, um, we're just going to say that it is, we're spinning, um, yeah, we'll eventually absorb little omega s in, into things, but let's just leave it that, that way for now. Okay, now we'll take a time derivative. So all time derivatives are gonna be with respect to the body fixed frame. I'll usually just write them as an over dot, but this is the, time derivative with respect to the B frame. Okay, omega three dot, why am I doing that? Because omega three dot shows up up here in this equation that comes from the mechanics. So omega three dot is omega S dot plus this smaller component and how it changes. Okay, so now let's plug in to this equation, we've got I3 and omega three dot minus I1 minus I2. I'm just copying what's above. Omega one, omega two equals zero. Now by assumption, omega one and omega two are both much smaller than omega S. So something small times something small is something really small, really small. So we can basically set those equal to zero, which means that we've got I3 omega three dot equals zero. Oh, we could put a squiggly if we want, say, you know, approximately, which means that omega three is equal to a constant, okay? And in hindsight, we didn't even have to divide up omega uh, three into omega s and big omega three. So we'll just absorb, we'll absorb this supposedly small component, big omega three into omega s. So omega s equals constant. And we're saying that omega three equals omega s. And it's a constant. So that's a big simplification. This large spin component we're assuming is constant. And it's by assumption that we're, we've started out, we're spinning mostly about one particular axis. And what we're going to be solving for is this part that's not along that axis, how does that evolve? So, so let's take a look. This means that now looking up here, we've got omega two, omega three, 
omega-3, omega-1, and we're saying that omega-3 equals omega-s, which is a constant. So in those terms up there, what will we have? If you can remember. So we'll have omega-2, not omega-s, omega-2, omega-3 equals omega-2 times omega-s. And also omega-3, omega-1 equals omega-s times omega-1. And omega-s is a constant. So up here, these things that are supposed to be quadratic terms actually become linear terms because this will be, right, this omega-3 is omega-s, a constant. So uh, these two ordinary differential equations for how the omega-1 and omega-2 components evolve are going to be linear ODEs. So that's a, that's a big simplification too. So the quadratic terms become linear in the, we're, we're talking about in the variables omega one and omega two. So if we work that out from the omega one dot equation, we, uh, we rearrange and we'll get omega one dot minus I two minus I three times omega S over I1 times omega 2 equals 0. Let's call this equation 1. That's for the omega 1 dot equation. Now for the omega 2 dot equation, what do we get? Uh, you know, similarly, we get. Um, I3 minus I1 omega S over I2. So we've got this thing, which is a constant, and this thing, which is a constant. And hold on, this is times omega 1 equals 0. So that's equation 2. So what do we have? We've got two coupled first order linear ordinary differential equations for uh, how omega one and omega two evolve in time. So this is a lot easier to solve than the initial set of three nonlinear ODEs. In fact, this is, this is completely equivalent to um, if we let x1 equal omega1 and x2 equal omega2, this looks like x1 dot minus a x2 equals zero, x2 dot minus b x1 equals zero. For some constants, a and b, which there would be a general way to solve this. You could write it in matrix form. Right. And this would be of the form, you know, X as a matrix dot equals A as a matrix X as a matrix. And we know how to solve that. We're not gonna use that approach, but you could. Instead, what we'll do is we will, you know, looking at this first differential equation up here, if we were to take the time derivative of that, let's take the time derivative of that first equation. So let's, you know, kind of leave this as an aside. We're not gonna take that approach. Let's uh, differentiate the uh, equation one and we get omega one double dot 
minus this constant times omega 2 dot equals 0. But we know how to write omega 2 dot from the second equation in terms of omega 1. So for this, now plug in what we have for equation 2. And what we'll end up with is omega 1 double dot plus, and I'm just going to write this big term. It looks like minus uh, I2 minus I3 omega S over I1 times uh, I3 minus I1 omega S over I2. Uh, curly brackets again, omega 1 equals 0. So now we've got this um, second order ODE, but it's linear. And it's in a very simple form. This is in the form omega 1 double dot plus, we'll call this squared term omega n squared. So this, this curly bracket term, we'll call that um, omega n squared. And then everything just depends on the sign of omega n. So maybe we'll call this equation one prime. And you might recognize this, right? If I wrote this as x double dot plus uh, omega squared x equals zero, hopefully you would recognize what that is. That's the equation for the simple harmonic oscillator. It's what you get for like a linear spring system. And it, it comes up a lot when we make these simplifying approximations. So because it's the simple harmonic oscillator, we know everything about it. Um, we know how to write the analytical solutions. Um, that mean, by that I mean closed form as a function of time. And uh, let's just remind ourselves what this, you know, critical frequency is. The squared frequency of the motion, omega n squared, is it's I2 um, no, I'll write it, I'll write it so it's it's I3 minus I2. So I've absorbed that negative sign into that first term and then times I3 minus I1 over I2 over I1 times omega S squared. So we have that. We don't even need to really write down the closed form solution. We know what the solutions look like. The solutions are sinusoidal. So as long as um, omega n squared, that quantity is greater than zero. So as long as we have that, then we have sinusoidal motion. Uh, at least for equation one prime. Okay, so what does that mean? That means, let's plot this. Just to sketch it out. So this means, you know, whatever we start with, uh, this is omega one versus time, 
This will be sinusoidal. And it'll have a period. So if you want to think of it as the distance between peaks in time, let's call that tau. This is 2 pi over omega n. So omega 1 as a function of time is periodic with period tau. That's the motion. And that was just for o omega 1. What if we did the same approach, but for omega 2? So if we say, OK, differentiate the omega 2 dot equation. And then you'd have omega 1 dot here. And up here, you substitute in what you get for omega 1 dot in terms of omega 2. You'll get another sinusoidal, or you'll, you'll get another simple harmonic oscillator. So similarly, we would find that omega 2 double dot, and it's the same constant, omega n squared times omega 2 equals 0. So maybe let's call this 2 prime. So that means omega 2 as a function of time is uh, also uh, sinusoidal. with the same period. Same period. Tau is 2 pi over omega n. And this all depended on, you know, omega n squared has to be greater than 0. OK. Um, <clears throat> So putting these two together, what do we have? Let me draw a, a sketch. So this is the, the body. So as seen in this body fixed frame, where we started out with um, a large spin in the B3 direction. Um, what happens to the angular velocity vector? Well, it's going to be moving around. So let, let's just plot what the tip does. Here's the tip. The tip would make a circular motion. So the angular velocity as a vector traces out a cone. velocity traces out a cone about uh, the B3 axis. So seen from above, if you want to kind of get an idea, seen from above, we would have, so here's like the B1 direction, and this is the B2. If we started with some initial omega 1 and omega 2, this is going to go around in a circle and then go back after one period, tau. Now, let's go back to this. Uh, assumption, as long as omega n squared is greater than zero, what does omega n squared greater than zero? What are the cases for that? Well, it, omega s squared is always greater than zero. Uh, omega, t, I mean, i2 times i1, that's always greater than zero. Now, the issue is in these differences between i3 and i2 and i3 and i1. So, we, to get that overall omega n squared is greater than zero, we need that i3 minus i2 times i3 minus i1 is greater than zero. This implies right, i3 minus i2 times 
I3 minus I1 is greater than zero. And this might not always be the case. So what are the cases? Well, if I3 is the largest uh, principal moment of inertia, we actually have two cases. One of them is this. If you know, I3 is greater than I2, and I3 is greater than I1. So that means that I3 is the largest moment of inertia. The other case is where you would get that this product up here equal is, is positive if I3 minus I2 is negative and I3 minus I1 is negative, which would mean we just reverse the direction of this equality. If I3 is less than I2 and I3 is less, I guess we'll just put an and just to make it clear, and I3 is less than I1. And that would mean that I3 is the smallest moment of inertia. And when this is the case, when I3 is the largest moment of inertia, then we would refer to B3 is the major axis. And in the case that I3 is the smallest, that would mean that the B3 direction is the minor axis. And you might think, well, okay, this is not, the case where uh, omega n is actually less than zero is if I3 is in between the two. So if it's uh, I1 is the largest or I2 is the largest and I3 is in the middle. <clears throat> and actually this plot that I've shown here, uh, this is the case, case one, it's plotted. Otherwise, the direction of the tip moving, I think, will be opposite. You can double check that. All right. So there is, when we have, when we have this going on, oh, we have omega n is greater than zero, and this kind of stable motion, we call that free body precession. So this motion. Free body precession. So there's this weird word. And there are there are two time scales for it. There's the there's the spin time scale. That is, let's call that tau s, you know, the period of spinning tau s, two pi over omega s. Remember, omega s is the projection of omega in the B3 direction. That's supposed to be large. So two pi over something large is something small. So tau s is small. So this means this is the fast time scale for the motion. There's a lot of spinning of the body it's rapidly spinning about B3, kind of. And then kind of the direction that it's spinning, we'll call that the precession time scale. Precession time scale is what we call you know, tau. We'll call it maybe tau n now, just to separate. It's two pi over omega n. And omega n is going to be slower. Uh, or tau n is going to be larger, so this is slow. And what does this precession time scale do? The precession time scale dictates how quickly the spin axis moves around the principal axis. 
So let's uh, let's see a picture of that, and we'll we'll be saying more about precisely solving for kind of the because uh, here we made an assumption. We'll actually solve it exactly I think, next time. But uh, where is it? Here is this is showing. There's this rapid spinning, and then there's kind of the direction that it's processing. Oops, let's try that again. Let's try another case. I think you can see it better here. Do you see how it's rapidly spinning about that number one direction because that's um, a principal axis and then the direction of that spin axis is slowly processing around. Let's see that again. So there's the rapid spinning about you know, that long axis of the body, which in this case, it is, uh, it's the minor axis, it's the minimum moment of inertia. And then there's a slower time scale of moving around. And one of these vectors, I think it's the blue one that you can hardly see, that's omega and it is tracing out a cone. Okay. So um, rotation, rotation about the the major and minor axis is stable. That means if you start out spinning something close to the major minor axis. So here's this body. Uh, oh, what do you know? I've made some cool vectors. Here's a vector, an orange vector. So if we calculated the moment of inertia for this, um, this is like the big side. There's lots of mass normal to the axis. So spinning about this, this is the, this is the major axis. The minimum is about this axis. So that'd be about the minor axis. So uh, if you start out with some angular velocity that's close to spinning purely about this direction, it'll be stable. Close to this one, it'll be stable. There's that third one. So it's the intermediate axis. And what happens if you start spinning about you know, almost the intermediate axis? Well, other things will happen. <clears throat> so what about the intermediate axis? Well, our, our assumption still holds, right? So this would be if you know, I3 is, um, if it's less than I1, but greater than I2, or it's less than I2, but greater than I3, in both of those cases, you get omega n squared is less than zero. So this would be like the ODE, if I have x double dot, um, plus a x equals zero, where a is less than zero. So we might rewrite this as x double dot equals magnitude of a times x. This, um, the solutions for this, solutions are not uh, periodic. In fact, they grow exponentially. So that means rotation about the intermediate axis is unstable. If you were to view in say the omega, uh, say the view from above, what is the tip of the angular velocity vector doing starting from this initial condition, say the same initial condition, instead of motion going circular about this origin here, right, the middle, it actually goes away. So we have, we're, we've got the angular velocity 
increases away from the uh, the B3 axis. So rotation about the intermediate axis is unstable. We're just doing a, under our assumptions, we can't really give the global picture of what's happening. It's not like the body explodes or something. It just, uh, if you start out spinning near the intermediate axis, you quickly are not <laughs> spinning about the intermediate axis in a short amount of time. So rotation, uh, starting near the intermediate axis is unstable. Let's, um, let's see an example of that if we can. Yeah, here is motion Oops, we don't want that. I don't know what's going on there. I think it's letting me rename it. I don't want to rename it. I just want to see it. Okay, so this is our box. I'll get my box out again. And now this is, it's going to be starting out rotating about this intermediate axis. So everything, it's starting really close to spinning. So it looks, oh, maybe that's stable. But actually, it is uh, that small initial condition away from the B3 or that. Uh, the axis, it makes it move away. And now it's spinning about kind of like the opposite side axis, but that's not going to last long. And then it'll flip over again. Um, so this is the more kind of global picture um, it, where you go beyond this kind of local approximation that we did to get to here. So it's, it's unstable. It looks like it's tumbling and it is. And you can see this if you were to toss a book up into the air uh, or spin a weird object like this, or even toss your phone. So I think that's what uh, Veritasium is showing here. I just want to get to the, cut to the chase. Okay, here he is spinning about a stable axis. The maximum moment of inertia, meaning it requires the most... I hope he, hope he was careful. Now he's, he spins it about some other axis. The intermediate axis yeah, the intermediate so axis, you try to flip it tumbles any quickly. Along its intermediate axis, it will not maintain simply that rotation. It will also get... Thank you, Veritasium. So it's unstable. And this is sometimes called the uh, tennis racket theorem. Uh, for... Uh, I, I don't know why. I mean, you may as well call it your phone theorem. It's because a tennis racket, if you were to toss a tennis racket, uh, it's, got, it's got its intermediate axis. So I think this is the, if we were to plot this, it's got, that would be the minor axis. And then the way that you would usually toss it would be, I think, about this axis, and that's intermediate. And then the one that's kind of perpendicular is the major axis. I don't know if I'm showing the exact center of mass of a, of a, of a tennis racket, but the tennis racket has, you know, it's, it's got, uh, it's not a symmetric thing. So if you were to toss the tennis racket, you'd, you'd see it do this flip just like you see if you toss a book or your iPhone. So we, this is sometimes summarized in terms of, um, let me show a figure. Here it is. This shows the torque free motion summarizing everything. Ta -da. So you could put green here for rotation about the major axis is stable. So if we're rotating about the major axis, and we call it the major axis because it's got the most moment of inertia. And then about the minor axis, minimum moment of inertia about that axis. That's also stable. But then 
this intermediate axis is not stable. It is in fact unstable. And this is um, this is a well-known phenomenon uh, once you know rigid body dy dynamics that for any particular body, like here's, here's a coffee cup I have, you could calculate the moments of inertia and there's probably some, the intermediate axis. I'm not about to toss this and demonstrate it. Um, we haven't talked about why you would want to spin things yet, but often satellites are spun and they, they want to spin them about a minor or a major axis because then that, that's just sort of naturally stabilized by rigid body dynamics itself. So if you want an object to say, it always has an antenna pointing at the earth and you would make it spin and in a direction that's pointing at the earth and make sure that's a major or minor axis of the body. If you have a satellite that's spinning about its intermediate axis, well, then it's gonna be tumbling and you'll, you know, you'll lose communication with it very quickly. So that's bad. Don't do that. Um, you might wonder, okay, this is a body out in space. So what's acting on it? And, you know, I don't know. Or why can't we always get pure rotation for a free frigid body? That doesn't make any sense. Uh, so I'll try to give you some intuition about that. So this is, you know, why don't, Why can't we just spin something about whatever direction we want and have it just be stable? Why is the universe conspiring to not let this be? This is for, this is for a free rigid body or for the torque free case. And remember this is, when we say torque free, we mean the external torque going back to the discussion about particles, but you could think of it as, this is all due to internal torques. So it's due to internal torques that are kind of hidden. Um, so let's try to build some intuition And we'll do it using uh, a three-point mass example. So I'll do a, I'll plot a, or draw over here a three-point mass, um, rigidly attached. And then we'll do some careful tracking of the forces between them. So if we've got a, we've got three particles. Let's do, here's particle one. And then we've got, I'll just do this in a triangular formation, particle two, and then over here, particle three. So if we had these three particles rigidly connected by massless rigid rods, um, yeah, so rigidly attached by massless rods, Then let's track the, the internal forces. So only internal forces would act if we've got no external force. Which would be the case out in space. All right, so on particle uh, one, we would have a force due to particle three. And let's just write this in terms of a tension. Tension on one due to three, and then there'd be a tension on one due to two. It'd be a tension on two due to one, and it would be the equal and opposite. And there'd also be a tension on two due to three and a tension on three due to two, which is equal and opposite. 
and up here, tension on three, two to one. So that would be the tracking of all of the tension that's present. All right. Now, now we've got this rigid triangular frame thing. And let's say we started it with some rotation. So that, you know, where's its center mass? It's somewhere. Sweet particle, here's the center mass. And we're starting it spinning about some direction. So start it spinning. Um, about uh, some direction. So that's the instantaneous angular velocity that we would get. So maybe we just say started spinning with an angular velocity. So we've got this spinning. At the initial time, it's got some angular velocity to it. Okay, so what, um, what forces are present to make this move in possibly weird ways? Well, we need to consider the angular momentum for all the particles and how they evolve. Because we're doing this from a particle approach. Consider the angular momentum for all the particles, in this case, just three, and how they evolve. So for say particle two, We've got the angular momentum of particle two with respect to the center of mass. It's going to be m2 r2g, right? We could you know, show, show that over here. Here's r2g times the inertial velocity of that. And because this is a rigid body, we know how to write I to G in terms of the angular velocity, angular velocity cross R. So this is M2 R2 G cross uh, omega cross R to G. This is the instantaneous angular momentum of uh, mass uh, M2. Maybe I'll put little M's over here, M, M, M. Okay, how is this changing? We got to calculate the internal, uh, we got, Inertial derivative, I H two G equals the moment on G. And it's all just due to internal things. So right, what's the internal moment? So what's the internal moment on particle two? Um, the internal moment in particle two is R two G, so the moment arm. Uh, cross the total force, total internal force. And what is the total internal force? It's T21 plus T23. So it's equal to the tension due to the other particles. And this tension due to the other particles it's not going to be zero. So that means the angular momentum vector, let me, uh, have I picked, have I used blue? So here's the, let's say here's the initial angular uh, momentum, particle two, that's going to be changing and same for the other two particles. So it's not zero. And uh, so similarly for the other two, if we were to calculate how these moments on particles one and two evolve, particles one, I mean, and three. 
the way that they evolve will be due to non-zero moments. And so it's the internal moments from internal forces that make it so we can't have pure rotation of a rigid body about any arbitrary direction. There are just some directions. There's only three where you can actually get pure motion and only two where you can get it pure rotation and it's stable, meaning if you're a little, little bit off, it won't wander away. So uh, it's, it's internal moments that usually get swept away when we talk about rigid body dynamics. Internal moments inside the rigid body, right? The thing that's actually holding it together to make it a rigid body leads to this problem. So due to internal forces, which, uh, Make it so we can't have pure rotation. About any arbitrary direction. And you know, that's sad, right? You know, too bad. In fact, there are only three. Only three directions where pure rotation is possible. I will say in general, because there are some shapes where you can rotate about any arbitrary direction. But in general, for a uh, standard shape, like here's the thing that holds my phone or a pen or something, except for very special shapes, there's only three directions where you get pure rot rotations. And those are the, the three principal axes of the body, which you can get from the eigenvectors of the moment of inertia matrix. And then, right, then we know only two of those are stable. You know. Okay. So, yeah, we're, we're not, this is just to, this exercise is just to kind of give you some intuition about why pure rotation about any d direction is not possible. So, okay. Now, in the last 15 minutes or so, I wanted to talk about something uh, fun. Well, I think it's fun because it doesn't, it's not too much math. It's called the qualitative analysis of spinning bodies in, in 3D. We'll get back to the, you know, free rigid body case and doing it carefully um, without making any approximations next time. Um, but this is an important subject. How do I introduce it? Here's my, if you could see in the video, I've got a, I've got a gyroscope. Okay. And if I, I've got it hanging by a string and it doesn't do anything, it doesn't do anything, it just falls, falls down. Um, if I actually get it spinning and then let go, if I get it spinning good, it'll, and I, and I let go, it'll actually start turning. All right, and our goal right now, we just wanna predict how it will turn. If I get it spinning, then will it you know, go towards you or will it go away from you initially? And this is part of the qualitative analysis of spinning bodies. And it can be helpful. So I will show, let me get a figure here to help describe what I'm talking about. This is a picture of uh, a gyroscope on a stand. I'm not gonna have mine on a stand. I'm gonna 
have it dangling by a string. But, um, and if you want to follow in the book where this is, this is uh, section 11.2.1, which I think is on page 473. So let's go back to an equation that describes, um, let me write the, an inertial frame. And this point, I'm going to call it Q. Okay. We've got our inertial frame. Let's call this the E3 direction. You know, E1, E2. Does that satisfy the right-hand rule? Yeah, good, it does. Okay. And if we were to write the, how the angular velocity of this body evolves, using Q as the reference point, then we have something like this. This is writing it, um, writing it out. Okay. What's our body fixed frame? Well, here's the, here's my, unfortunately I've chosen red for this, but right, I'll choose some direction that's along the axis, this will be spinning and then the other two axes. Okay, so I've got, um, I'm going to write green here. Let's just say the center of mass is here. Here's B1. Here's B2. And then B1 cross B2, we get B3. So the B frame is uh, attached to well, literally the frame. And there's this, this um, flywheel that can spin with respect to the frame, okay? So the B frame is attached to the frame. The flywheel It just means it's it's heavy. It's got mass towards the outside. This flywheel can spin with respect to the B frame. In particular, it spins about uh, in this case the B1 axis. And we're going to say that the the flywheel can spin very rapidly. It's been uh, if we say that it spins very rapidly then this implies uh, that the moment of an, the angular momentum is large. And we're gonna assume that it's large and it's not changing much with respect to the B frame. So we can say that this term here, this, how does uh, IHQ, it's some um, running out of colors Let's use orange or something. Okay, so it's we've got the flywheel. It's spinning very, very rapidly. And it's not changing much. So with respect to the B-frame, we could say that's zero. So it spins very rapidly and uh, relatively constant. So this implies uh, that this other part is the equation that we care about. So it's omega of the B frame with respect to the inertial frame cross this angular momentum equals the moment. And maybe well, instead of saying equals, we put a, a you know approximate. So this is the key equation for the qualitative analysis. And it's really just trying to figure out uh, the directions of things. So this is, I think in your book, this is similar to 11.9. Now for this case, this thing's spinning and it's got a fixed point, whether that's a, a, a stand that it's resting on or just the end of this string, 
uh, we're going to say that IHQ is completely, um, at least in this case, IHQ is H in the B1 direction, where H is large greater than zero, okay? So we're just gonna approximate, this is really large, it's spinning rapidly uh, about the B1 direction, which, so B1 in this case would be like this axis that I'll be spinning the flywheel about, okay? What is the, what is the moment? Uh, I guess we gotta figure this out. The moment will be due to gravity, so there's this moment arm acting on center of mass, and then we have Fg. So if you do that moment arm from Q, this is R, Q, oh no, it's R, sorry, G. Right, that's how we write things. It's location of G with respect to Q. M, Q is R, Q, no, I keep doing it wrong. R, G, Q cross F, G. And let's figure out what direction that's in. Um, we're going to choose it so that uh, we're going to write it as that's in the B2 direction. So let's call that M in the B2 direction. Um, where M is greater than zero. Then we want to figure out from this equation up here approximately what direction is uh, omega. So how is the B frame moving with respect to the inertial frame? So let's call this equation star and it's um, for equation star to be true. What do we need? We need, so we would need omega cross H equals M. So we need omega in the approximately the E3 direction, right? So suppose that was the, the case. So if we've got um, I omega B is in the, it's omega in the E3 direction. So omega cross H is in the B2 direction. So that means that if we get this thing spinning rapidly, the whole frame here is going to just kind of go around. It's because it's the thing is rotating uh, about the um, the vertical direction. So it's approximately omega in the e three direction. That is the this, this this so this means B frame processes about the vertical direction. Okay, and let so let's try that. We're going to try to analyze. I'm going to turn this off. Uh, broadcasting. Okay, I've got my got my uh, thing, and I want to get it spinning. So I'm going to spin it so that it's got a large uh, angular velocity in this direction. So to get that to happen, I have to. I'll put in this thing that gets it going. I'm going to pull it like this, and it's going to get it going. So that will be. There's a large H in this direction. When I'm holding it by the string, what is the moment going to be? Just qualitatively, so it's to the center mass cross gravity. So the moment is actually pointing towards me. So what will omega be? Let's guess that omega is in this direction. So omega, from that qualitative equation, it said omega cross h. So Right hand rule, omega cross h. Now my thumb is actually pointing in the direction the moment is supposed to be. So I predict when I get this thing spinning, at first it'll go towards me. 
Okay. Let me get this thing going. Okay. So I'm gonna grab the string. Hope this doesn't like jump anywhere. Here it goes. I'm gonna let go. Oh, it did it. It did it. Yeah. So that omega direction is along that vertical direction, the string. And that's just from qualitative analysis. Uh, if you wanted to get more quantitative, right now we're just saying, okay, what direction is it going to go? So remember what we did there? I got this spinning so that omega, uh, H, the angular momentum was in this direction. The moment I knew it was down. So I kind of, I had to figure out well, what omega would give me omega cross H is in that M direction. 